Hi and welcome to Matrix Moments. This is Saloni and today's episode is part of our Reflection series. Joining us today on this episode are Ilya Sukhar, partner at Matrix Partners and Vikram Vaidyanathan, managing director at Matrix Partners India. On this episode, we discuss the learnings from Ilya's early journey of being a founder, his transition to an early stage VC firm Matrix Partners and what drove that decision. While at Matrix, Ilya led the investment for Fivetran, a SaaS company that's a leading provider of automated data integration. Ilya takes us through the thought process behind that investment and much more. Tune in. Welcome everyone to another episode of the Matrix Moments podcast. It gives me great pleasure in welcoming Ilya Sukar. Uh, he's our partner in the US and has been for the last five years. I'm super excited about this episode, going into his journey uh, of being an early stage investor, a founder, and then about his recent investment in Fivetron, which has done really well for us. Um, what stands out about Ilya for me is that he's a He's got an extremely technical background, um, bachelor's in computer science and master's in computer science as well. I don't know if he finished his master's, but I, I think he definitely... I did, started. I did. <laughs> oh, did. Yeah. Uh, both at Cornell, um, ended up in the startup space with a Y Combinator startup called Etax, uh, which was acquired by Salesforce and then ended up doing something on his own. Uh, one of the early batches at Y Combinator 2011, uh, the startup was called Parse. It was a, I guess it was a dev tool startup uh, providing mobile SDKs uh, to, uh, to devs at that time. Had a pretty good exit. Uh, acquired by Facebook for 100 million uh, in 2013. Yep. And uh, at that time, that was a big number. Um, spent like three years at Facebook. Uh, you might have seen him at, at a lot of the, the Facebook dev conference videos. I was looking at an F8 dev conference video. Uh, where I think you were part of the keynote there. Uh, did that till 2016. I think he was a prolific angel investor hanging around the Y Combinator community and as a part-time partner at, at Y Combinator and then ended up joining Matrix in 2016, which we are very thankful for. Mm-hmm. Uh, led a bunch of investments here around the core tech uh, and enterprise tech space. Uh, Fivetran, Flock Safety, Height, Mastion, to name a few. Uh, so... Thank you, Ilya, for joining us and uh, really appreciate the time. I'm going to start with sort of the parse days and maybe the sort of midpoint of the journey. Uh, yep. Talk us through that time. I, I know you were hanging out in the Y Combinator community. How did you come up with that idea and also sort of the founding team? Yeah, so um, I came out of school wanting to get into startups um, and you know, that's mostly through a love of programming and kind of an exposure to uh, the startup ecosystem because I happen to have grown up in, in the Bay Area here in California. And so I came out of school, um, jumped into a company called Uyala, where I was just an early engineer and uh, I loved it. You know, I learned a ton, you know, I built a ton, but most importantly, I, I got the experience to see, you know, all parts of the business. I got to see, you know, what it's like to recruit engineers. I got to see what it's like to do a little bit of BD, what PMing is like, just kind of everything involved in getting something to market. And so um, I just kind of kept making progress on trying to go earlier and earlier and trying to get more and more uh, responsibility and ownership and impact. And so, like you said, the next stop on the on the journey was a company called Etax. We were kind of making a consumer personal CRM, um, which in retrospect uh, was a very difficult idea. I think we got a lot of users. We had a really hard time monetizing it. We had a, a nice soft landing at Salesforce, and you know I uh, I was very fortunate to have that outcome at the time that I did. It definitely you know gave me a little bit of a cushion uh, in the bank account and. Um, gave me a taste for kind of what the end to end journey could be, although it was pretty short. And so um, we landed at Salesforce and, you know, I, 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 it was a longer story, but I didn't want to stay at Salesforce. And so I, I, I did kind of the bare minimum there in terms of making sure our team got integrated and we got our project going, but I only stayed, I stayed less than six months, I think. Um, and, you know, I felt like, okay, the next step is to really start, start a company that's my own from day one. You know, I want to be a CEO. I want to start a company. 
Um, and so I was young, this was 2010, 2011, the kind of the hottest thing in Silicon Valley at the time was like mobile in particular, you know, social local mobile apps, things like Foursquare, um, Gawala, I think Instagram was coming down the pipe. Um, just basically consumer mobile uh, was, was really the hottest thing. And so I pursued that. I spent probably six months in my apartment, in my one bedroom apartment on my own, um, diving into mobile, building apps for my friends, you know, begging them to use the apps, um, seeing what the feedback was like. And I think um, somewhere, you know, somewhere after six months of doing that, I think I came to the conclusion that I didn't have an innate talent for um, uh, the consumer side uh, of uh, of apps, I think you know a lot of these apps were about socializing and about going out and about big friend groups. And honestly, I was not doing that. I was sitting in my apartment writing code and struggling with Xcode and 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 all that stuff. And that's kind of my personality. I'm, I'm not you know the most um, out there social person. And so you know I kind of had this moment of intellectual honesty. It's like okay. Am I really going to be the one to come through? Come through with you know the next great uh, next great app that competes with Foursquare. Um, but what I did come to understand was that the world of mobile tooling, uh, the kind of the the work to be done in this new age of mobile for developers who are trying to build these sorts of apps, was was really an opportunity to to to, to work on. Um, you know everything that people relied on in terms of open source projects, in terms of cloud infrastructure, in terms of um, tooling was really optimized for the web. Like we were coming off, you know, 10 years of, of kind of web, web 2.0, as people called it, um, you know, JavaScript apps as, as kind of the primary delivery mechanism for experiences. And, you know, suddenly Apple launches the app store. Apple has, you know, a tool chain for compiling the apps on their devices, but, um, they really did very little and the, the whole ecosystem had very little for bridging the gap between the sort of work you have to do on the client side to build a nice experience, you know, get all the screens right, do the transitions, the gradients, the UX, the polish, you know, the, the Apple way of doing things um, on the client and all the stuff underneath the hood. And the stuff underneath the hood exploded in complexity relative to the web because you can't just reload the app to, to ship a new version, you know, the phones aren't always online. Connectivity back then was not as good. Um, it's still, you know, not uh, not something you can totally rely on. And so you have to deal with all these new challenges of, as a developer, there's a bunch of devices out there. They're running different versions of your app. Um, they're not always connected. Um, you need to cache things. You need to uh, you need to deal with this whole new level of complexity. And so basically, the idea of Parse came from that, which is like, okay people are gonna start focusing on how to deliver great consumer experiences, but there's just a set of backend services that they all need. There's just an 80% commonality between the sorts of things that people are building on the backend and underneath the hood. So flexible data storage, push notifications, lightweight analytics, you know, auth, um, all that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, that was, that was where the idea of Parse came from. So I, I think I read somewhere or maybe I, I heard one of your podcasts that you sort of found your founders in sort of strangers or ad hoc um, introductions that were made from the Y Combinator community. And that's exactly the opposite of what we tell yeah. founders to do, which is to find your co-founders in your shared history. Uh, so how did you go about doing that? And what advice do you have for founders who find themselves in that situation where they sort of connect with somebody Who's, but it's a fresh introduction. You don't really know that person. And then you have to go on this founding journey together. Yeah, I mean, I definitely don't think it's the optimal way to do it. I wouldn't do it again. And I wouldn't recommend other people do it. But, you know, um, I was young and I wanted to get, get going. And so the way it really happened was um, I had applied to Y Combinator. So eTax was a Y Combinator company. I had joined them right after they got out of demo day. So I wasn't like a true co-founder, but I was kind of like a late ad co-founder. I was, you know, there early and I, and I, I, I was definitely in the mix of, of the YC ecosystem as a result. 
So after that, I applied to YC. I applied by myself. I actually applied with one of these consumer ideas. And when I did the interview, I think it went fine. Um, but I'm not, they didn't love the idea clearly. And so I walked out. Um, I walked out thinking like, I'm probably not going to get in. I'll try again later. You know, I, I, my heart was not in the idea to be perfectly honest. And so I wasn't super dejected. I was like, okay, now I know what it's like. I know what it's like to interview. Um, it'll, it'll be better next time. Uh, but actually as I was walking to my car, it's a, you know, go drive home or whatnot. Um, Paul Graham ran after me. He like ran, he like, you know, he's like got his like uh, Birkenstocks and his shorts and his like orange polo or whatever. And he's running after me. And I was like, oh man, what did I do? Did I leave something behind? Like, what, why is he running after me? And he, you know, the, the short of it is he was like, look, we really like you. We hate your idea. We're going to let you in. We strongly encourage two things. Um, find a new idea and find some co-founders. Uh, Cause they, at the time, and I think even today, you know, they're pretty anti six solo founders. Um, and so, uh, there was a period of time between, you know, the interviews when you get on, get in and when the program actually starts. And during that period is kind of when I, uh, like I said, I, I kind of had this, you know, actual, uh, <laughs> sit down with myself and was like, okay, this consumer stuff's not working. Maybe I'll work on something, uh, like parse. Um, and during that time, Paul Graham, you know, kept in touch with me and I kept him updated on kind of the ideas and, and what I was, what I was thinking about. And he introduced me to Kevin Lacker, who had also done a prior YC startup, like a Facebook gaming startup. Um, and we met up and I remember we were sitting in like a mission, uh, burrito shop and it was kind of this, this moment where we, we found, we were kind of in the same place where we had this, you know, prior set of projects that we were trying to move, move beyond. We had a set of new ideas and we were just pitching them to each other. And I think, uh, you know, he hated the parse idea the least of all. And so we decided to, to try to work together and, and went through a period of, of, you know, sitting in my apartment, um, writing code together and kind of trying to get on the same page. I think we, you know, we were lucky. We, we really, uh, I think, found a good fit there um, and uh, kind of went to YC and got going. Um, so that was one great, that was, that was one crazy thing we did. I can tell, I can talk about the next crazy move we did with, with regards to co-founders. Uh, can, can I pause you there? Uh, yeah. I also heard you say uh, somewhere that um, you, you always wanted to figure out early whether you could have arguments with your co-founders or yeah. with your husband. And how important was that period of, you know, working together, having those arguments and what would your advice founders to do in that sort of, you know, critical dating period? Yeah, you know, I think it's helpful that... Uh, uh, Kevin and I have both kind of strong opinions and I think enjoy a little bit of debate. And so it kind of came out naturally. And I think we found ways to productively work through, uh, work through some, some kind of differences of, of opinion on various things. And so it was super important. I think in that moment, in that time, I, I can't say I did it very deliberately. You know, we were just trying to build something, see what happens, you know, the, the, the stakes were low, right? Um, uh, there was a very high chance that we, we just kind of parted ways before YC started. So it was fine. I, I will say, I think in later, later moments, I, I've done that much more deliberately. I think other people, especially when there's not this kind of um, equal dynamic where you're jumping in together, it's like one person is joining another in terms of, you know, uh, following a lead i do think it's super important to find ways to bring up potential disagreements and so when i talk to founders today or when I, you know I, I interview people i try to be very you know nice about it but part of what i'm trying to do is pick a little bit of an argument try to question some of the assumptions and 
things they've built in the past or career moves they've made or you know decisions that they feel very strongly about going forward and i see how people engage on that you know do they it's all over the map right some people um clam up and, and don't want to engage some people get very defensive and i think at the end of the day good productive working relationships uh depend on um an openness to revisiting things and 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 working through them go to the next crazy thing that, that you did i suspect you're going to yeah talk so i mean next to <laughs> co-founders that you uh, yeah 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 so so i think the thing required. the thing we did later is we were in yc we were kind of halfway through the three month batch um uh i think we've launched our v1 you know relatively speaking from getting to a, you know from getting from a standing stop to to where we were we you know we had momentum and we felt pretty good about what we were working on i think kevin and i were were a good working duo um we'd gotten to know you know it was small batches back then so we'd gotten to know a lot of people and there was another team that i think was going through a um you know kind of a a, a rethinking moment they were working on something that basically was stripe but stripe at the time already existed i think stripe was maybe 18 months old it was still private beta but there was kind of this sense of like do you really want to do that same idea it's a small community i think competing amongst the yc ecosystem at the time was not like a super common thing to do um and so they were like mm, we should probably work this duo uh james and tcon were were like we should probably do something else and so the crazy thing we did is we basically said come on board we'll go from two founders to four founders we need help you guys are good hackers um let's let's do this like we we need we need more firepower we're aggressive let's go and that was super crazy i do not recommend doing that um it sort of worked it sort of didn't um but um yeah that's 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 kind of the mode we were in it's like we're going to we're going to make this thing happen or die trying and we we were not thinking necessarily about the long term implications of what it's like to have you know go from two decision makers that only know each other for a few months to four decision makers that only yeah. know each other for a few months so uh in the end it worked but uh, i certainly do not recommend that to to anyone Sounds out there an amazing memorable time <laughs> fast forward things go things go well you guys get acquired by facebook uh you're doing a, a bunch of amazing things there building out their developer platform you're investing in uh yc startups part time as a as a venture partner so yeah. what got you interested in early stage investing first and then what made you want to do it sort of institutionally and become an institutional investor Yeah um I think so kind of I think it started uh during my time at Facebook where um I was fortunate to have a pretty big role there you know run parse semi autonomously also be the product leader for the whole developer group all of the APIs all of the all of the stuff that happened at FA uh every year and um look at the end of the day that job is very different from kind of where i was coming from right i was a, i was a hacker that loved shipping product and like the fast feedback loop of of that and you know being in a senior ish role at facebook is a lot of people stuff a lot of resource allocation a lot of alignment with other parts of the company um you know it, it's 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 big company life although at the time the company was much smaller than it is today and so i i looked to angel investing as a way to just keep my mind in the place where i had the most fun and so you know meeting up with with teams of two that are just getting going you know writing them a small check meeting up with them periodically trying to help them i didn't think that was going to be a career move i didn't think that was going to make me any money honestly it was like a hedge against you know spending 8 hours a day 10 hours a day in meetings um it was what you did for fun yeah yeah it was just a fun little hobby um and i was fortunate to get asked to be that part time partner at, at yc and so i you know i did interviews i did office hours and that was still it was just fun like uh, i don't think there was a clear path to going full time there 
uh, at the time. It was a bit of a family business. And so I was just, you know, just having fun. I think the way it turned into a more serious thing um, was after I left Facebook, I came out of Facebook thinking I would start another company. Um, I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder with regards to the parse journey, because in the end, I think we sold too early. I think we had a really big opportunity at Facebook and we're seizing it, but for good reason, for lots of reasons I can get into, the company basically moved on from, from our project. Um, the sort of strategic underpinnings of the acquisition, you know, the, the desire to give us headcount and kind of fund our fund our project over three years kind of kind of uh, went away. And so um, uh, yeah, I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder and I was like, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to surpass myself. I'm going to go much further in the journey. And I spent like six months trying to um, spin up projects. Um, and again, now having had even more experience, I had a moment um, where I was like, I don't think any of these projects are, are, uh, are the sort of project I want to spend another five, 10 years of my life on. Um, so maybe I need to step back and maybe I'll start another company again one day, but I'm not going to start it right now. I don't want to force it. I've done early stage startups. You can't force it. If you do it just to do it, you're in for a world of pain. And so, um, during that time, again, I was for fun meeting up with people, writing angel checks, and I was getting hit up by VCs, like, you know, real VCs with funds and checkbooks. Mostly, I think, because they were curious what I was going to work on next. And in those conversations, I think I started to reveal like, hey, I thought I was going to start another company. That's why you're here with me. Um, but I don't think it's going to happen right now. You're wasting your time. I'll let you know. And a lot of people were like, cool, thanks for letting me know. I'll see you later. But some people were like, hey, we noticed you on a bunch of cap tables that are interesting. We notice you angel investing out there. You know, have you ever thought about doing this more seriously? Um, and my first reaction was like, no, I'm not, you know, I'm a builder. I'm not gonna, what are you talking about? Like, I don't know how to do that. Um, but I think after some conversations and after some reflection, I was like, actually, I am doing that. You know, I'm out there trying to find good opportunities, trying to help them, trying to get on the cap table. I think relatively successful at it. And so I looked at it as like, okay, I didn't really set out to be a VC, but I'm kind of voting with my feet. I'm doing it with my own checking account. I'm doing it with my time. I don't, you know, I don't need to be doing this. I can do a lot of things, so I must enjoy it. And so I had this moment where I was like, okay, I'll explore it. And then through conversations, I ended up joining Matrix. So it's been about five years as a, yeah. as a team. What makes you stay? What makes me stay? I enjoy it. I think it is, um, this might be a little bit controversial um, and, and there's definitely flip sides of it, but I think it's actually much more intellectually stimulating than being a founder in a lot of ways. Like being a founder is very rewarding in many other ways. Um, but you've got the blinders on, you're working on your narrow slice of the world. You're very focused on your team. You're very focused on just pushing the ball forward, you know, inch by inch, foot by foot. Um, I think the role I'm in today, I get paid to learn. Um, and I think that is super special and, and rare, right? Like um, I can keep expanding my horizons. I can keep, uh, learning new things and uh, I can be on a number of journeys, you know, at the same time. And so I just really enjoy that. Like in the last three weeks, I've been getting a little bit more interested in, in the intersection of technology and healthcare, not a place I know anything about. I spent the last three weeks going deep on it and I still don't know anything, but I know a little bit more. Yeah. And I, I think that's, pretty remarkable. I mean, I think the other thing is at this point, five years in, I've got a portfolio that I really care about. There's, you know, multi-year relationships. Some of them are five years old. Some of them are three, four years old where uh, 
I really want to see how those stories yep. end. Um, it's, it's, it's a special thing to like build those relationships, be on those boards, see the progress, see people get through hard times and um, there's more to come. Awesome. You, you know, I've asked this question many different ways to different VCs and it's amazing how consistent the reasons are. The w- one thing everyone says is that you get paid to learn and grow and then you can be relevant across cycles. And the second, it's the relationships and journeys that you get to go on with, with founders. Uh, and at least for me, that, that's what keeps me going. Um, yeah. it, this is sort of a great segue into Fivetran, and I'm just going to introduce Fivetran for, uh, for our dis- listeners. It's um, the best way to describe it. It's a data integration software company. Uh, it essentially does data connectors, and we'll get into what those connectors are. Uh, takes data from diverse sources for a large enterprise, figures out automatic connectors and how to uh, update those, uh, that set of data into a data warehouse. And then it's good to go for your data scientists and your business analysts. Um, now it sounds pretty simple, uh, but it's got pretty nuanced uh, and complicated technology in it. Uh, Ilya led the Series A, uh, 15 million in d- December 18. Um, and we'll get into the history of that, of that company till December 18. Uh, and since then, the company's just been on a tear. Um, they raised 565 million from uh, Andreessen and GC early, uh, earlier this year at a 5.6 million valuation. Um, I was just congratulating Ilya on, the, on that investment and that, and that journey. So let's get into that story. And I want to start with George as a, as a founder. I had the pleasure of listening to him at one of our annual meetings. He, he seemed like an incredibly unassuming, humble guy. Uh, I went back to his background and I was surprised to see a bachelor's in cognitive science, a PhD in neurobiology, uh, didn't seem like, and then he just got into startups. So really didn't seem like the background to start like a core tech company and seems like there's like an amazing founder story there. So what's the story? Yeah, um, that's right. He is a scientist really kind of by, uh, by background, I think immediately prior to starting this company, he was in a, in a therapeutics company. Um, it's an interesting journey. And I think it, it um, has some parallels to mine, which I think we, 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 we talked about and kind of hit it off on. Um, so he and his childhood friend, Taylor started a company um, that, did, you know, has like vague overlap with what Fivetran does today but really uh, started out quite different. So they started out basically trying to build a new um, interface for data science, Um, uh, like a whole new UX for it. I think it came from his experience struggling with kind of incumbent tooling to get his job done uh, as a bench scientist uh, in a lab. and uh, they didn't have much success with it. Uh, you know, it was the sort of thing that I think um, they built probably uh, a little bit in a vacuum, uh, a little bit based on their conception of what people would want. And I think they went through um, a, a really hard time trying to get traction for it. Did not get a lot of love coming out of YC. Kind of, you know, graduated and had you know the immediate trough of sorrow that that Paul Graham talks about. Um, and I think the the emergence of a five tran came again you know this is where the parallel is to to parse and in my journey from from thinking through like what are the underlying problems that actually uh have you know uh uh more tractable solutions that they can go target that will maybe one day enable kind of the original vision of, of making data science easier and so um the way it boils down to uh, down to it is they went out to a bunch of customers trying to pitch this new platform. The customers like were like, yeah, you know, our actual problem is is getting data from you know one place to another. Um, we are uh, adopting these new cloud data warehouses, Redshift, Snowflake, BigQuery. Um, theoretically, we will then layer on new HBI tooling, new age data science tooling. You know, maybe we'll talk to you later, but we are just in the early innings of replatforming on this kind of new stack that at the time had no real 
term for it. It was really just these cloud data warehouses that people were excited about. Um, and so they started to try to like solve whatever problem they could for those customers. And I think that uh, basically meant building bespoke connectors to take data from Salesforce and get it into Snowflake data from um, Zendesk and get it into to Snowflake. And they had a really unique approach to that relative to kind of the alternatives that we can get into. But I think that is the evolution of the company. And so Fivetran is not one of those stories that, you know, uh, immediate up and to the right, you know, brilliant yeah. idea that works day but, one. It is, it is a multi-year journey that, that uh, has let's culminated. Get into a, a little bit of that, of that journey. They started up in 2013. Yeah. Uh, ended up uh, uh, coming out of YC maybe around that time. And then uh, they really didn't go anywhere till 2017, 18. And, at, and you know, as VCs, uh, you usually have a bias against, hey, if this hasn't gone somewhere quick, then it might not go anywhere. So how did you get around that bias and how did you get to backing these guys and what sort of stood out about, especially about George and, and his team that you backed them then? I mean, I think what helped is I was coming from a place of seeking out solutions to the problem that they were now solving. And so my intersection with them was I had, I had through other conversations become aware of the impact that these new cloud data warehouses were having on kind of the entire stack. So um, it actually started with Redshift, right? I kept hearing Redshift come up and then I started talking to companies working on uh, really just kind of solving a lot of the problems with Redshift. So there was a wave of companies that were basically like APM and tooling for Redshift because Redshift has a lot of uh, cost and performance issues. Um, I didn't end up investing in any of those. Then I started to learn about Snowflake and BigQuery and kind of understand that this movement was happening. Um, you know, what do you need to do to actually make use of these cloud data warehouses? You have to get the data in there. It's pretty simple at the end of the day. There's a whole, you know, incumbent world that that deals in ETL. I had built uh, ETL pipelines in my first company at Uyala with like the Hadoop ecosystem, Hive, HDFS, like you know, writing you know, Java code. Um, so I was familiar with the with the problem space. I met some of Five Trans competitors first. Actually, uh, there was another YC company called ET Leap. There was uh, Aluma, which was an Israeli company. There was X Plenty. Um, I didn't meet all of them, but I met a, a subset of kind of half a dozen competitors that Fivetran had. And actually, Fivetran was, was probably the last one that we ended up meeting. And so I think we came to the conversation um, primed in believing there is a problem to be solved here and there's an opportunity. And I think what blew me away, what blew the team away was George. George and Taylor had a very different approach to the problem, very, uh, uh, you know, in some ways at the time, controversial approach to the problem. I think that the entire, you know, history of ETL was flexibility, was um, the most so, important. So I'm just going to pause you there, and I think we're going to get into the meat of this. So yeah. ETL for our listeners is extract, transform, load, and that's the way... Yeah everyone was doing it. So you had all these uh, data warehouses, Snowflake and so on, which were getting cheaper. And then you had all these data scientists working on them. Uh, and there was, there was sort of an established way of getting data into these warehouses, which was extract, then you transform sort of at the source, and then you load it into the data warehouse. And at least the way I understand it, what uh, Fivetran came up with was flip it on, it on its head and instead of ETL, do ELP. Uh, in in some way and do transform at destination, uh, and then I'm going to hand over to you because that's all I understand. Yeah, yeah. So I think what's important to understand about kind of the the prior ETL approaches is all of the people who had done it before. You know, when I was writing the Java code in my first job out of college, you're working with different constraints. You're working with constraints where um, the data warehouse is really hard to manage. It's expensive. It's difficult to scale, um, and so the transform is really important in that in that uh, in that environment where you you have tons of source data, and then you use the kind of whatever the transform layer is in your stack, whether it's you know a proprietary product like Informatica or it's you know 
uh, Hadoop code like I'd worked with to whittle, whittle the data down to like what you actually need out of it in that moment, in the, in the rollups and in the dimensions that you need in that moment so that you store kind of only what you need. You don't like, you know, explode your, your data warehouse uh, uh, with, with resource demands. Um, and you let kind of the, the consumers of the data, you know, have it in the format that they need to just get going and, 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 and work on top of it because, um, you know, you want them to do really simple queries to kind of then work with it later down the road. I think what changed and what George and Taylor really saw was the cloud data warehouses just turn that upside down. It's actually quite cheap to just dump all your data in there. Um, it's quite performant to query it uh, uh, downstream. Um, however, you need to you know, crunch it later. Um, and it's just not that expensive at the end of the day. And so you, you just get to a place where um, if you can store as much as available in an approximately good format, the best format that you can generically imagine, then why wouldn't you? And so that's basically the the Fivetran ELT approach. At the time, really, Fivetran only did E and L. You know, they talked about ELT because you don't want to just drop the T and and have people asking where it went. The yeah. T was like, yeah, just do it later, do it in in SQL on top of Snowflake or whatnot. But they really did E and L, and so their approach was like, look. Um, well, the, the the other thing that's worth mentioning is that when you look at kind of where data lives in an enterprise, 20 years ago, the vast majority of it lives in your own databases, right? It's in your proprietary databases that are generated by your own code um, and in the schema that you designed for your business. And that still exists today, but like uh, actually where data lives in the enterprise is all over the place. Like everyone's using a bunch of SaaS tools. And so when you think about centralizing your data and running analytics on your business, you can't just be looking at your own database. You have to go pull data out of Salesforce and Zendesk and Stripe and uh, NetApp and what whatnot. Um, and so the combination of those two sh big shifts is, is is the insight that they had. And it's like, okay, we're going to build bespoke connectors for all of these data sources. So you're going to give us your Salesforce instance, and we're going to give you at, at 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 the end of the uh, end of the pipeline. Uh, a set of tables in your Snowflake instance that have all of your Salesforce data in a format that is uh, very, you know, nicely laid out. It's very thought through. We've thought through all the edge cases. We've thought through all the error handling. We're going to give it to you kind of in this golden scheme of format. It's not going to be perfect for you because we don't know what you want to do with it, but it's going to get you quite far. And I think doing it that way is super controversial because it uh, assumes a very different set of uh, um, constraints. And it basically takes all the control away from the customer. It says to the customer, you know, you're used to building these connectors yourself. You're used to tons of knobs and tuning. You don't really need that. Our advantage, five trans advantage is we see everyone's Salesforce instance. We know the variety of things uh, that are, quirky or painful about their API. Uh, we know um, the pitfalls you can fall into as you lay out this data in your data warehouse and try to do things with it. We're gonna, we're gonna apply a lot of opinion and judgment that is unique to that data source in building this connector. And it's just gonna be you know, a one-click thing. There's nothing to configure about it. You auth your instance and there it is. So one of the things that stands out for me, at least looking from afar, is the is the focus that the company had on just doing that, which is yeah. figuring out, and I saw some of the key metrics that they published, it was um, focused around 99.9% .9 reliability. And then the number of these bespoke connectors that they were they, that they were offering, and that was it, right? And maybe there were a few others, but that kind of focus usually indicates something special happening in the company, which is a very high clarity of focus on what they want to do and what they don't, more importantly. Yep. And second, 
that sort of seeping into the underlying culture can you sort yeah. of comment and and share more on that yeah i mean that is absolutely a big um big cultural thing at the company i think george uh likes to talk about it like you know we are like a utility company like you give us connections to your data and we move it to the place you want it to go we want it to be as reliable as simple as you know uh generic as you know the wall socket giving you electricity we are we are you know laser focused on on just solving that problem and i think um i think a lot of people um you know, three, four years ago would say that's not enough or there's not enough complexity there. And I, and I think what they understood is that there is plenty of complexity there and doing, building a connector for a data source that is like 95% good is like 10% of the work of, you know, building a connector that's 99% good um, because uh, these APIs are not as like, they don't behave as predictably as you'd think. There are all sorts of edge cases. There's all sorts of errors that come up. Every customer's instance of Salesforce or Stripe or NetApp or whatnot ends up actually being quite different. And so they have always been focused on just climbing that frontier of quality and just always trying to be better and better and better so that the next incremental customer when they hook up their source, it just works. It's, it's not like a thing that you just finish doing because the sources evolve, the way they generate data evolves, the errors evolve. Um, and there's no magic to it. You, you, yes, you can build frameworks, you can build tooling that makes it easier to deal with certain types of problems. And, and they have done a lot of that, but you have to innately understand these data sources. and. Um, yeah, they've always been laser focused on that. So well, that's a good segue into uh, uh, the next topic that I wanted to talk about. So it's a extremely technical founder working on an enterprise tech product. Yep. Uh, usually when I see that combination, they struggle with sort of the GTM, right? Uh, the marketing message, the sales motion, but it seemed like these guys figured it out pretty quickly. So what are some of the learnings from that period and what sort of work for them and uh, how does how does that sort of work for technical founders trying to build this today from India? Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that's worth mentioning is um, George is a very technical guy, right? Again, he's kind of a scientist uh, by training, but his, his co-founder Taylor is not. His co-founder Taylor, um, I think, is probably a design mind by, by training, but also a very kind of... Uh, um, um, the kind of personality that's good at like hearing people out, that is good at the like early, um, um, you know, nuances of, of early sales. And so I think, I think when their, um, when their first idea didn't work, I think the way that they sort of split the, split the responsibilities was like, Taylor, you go, you go talk to these people who aren't buying our product about their problems and I'll go build a solution and we'll just iterate from there. And so, I mean, the lesson learned is, is at the end of the day, yeah, you, you know, it is a mix of skills and they were fortunate to have that mix of skills and with lots of trust, their childhood friends and, and have, have known each other forever. And so they had that uh, trust to kind of um, uh, split the tasks and, and, and keep charging forward. Um, uh, but yeah, this is something that I, I think I struggle with as an investor, which is I'm a technical person. I think, you know, I became decent at sales. You know, this job in some ways is about sales that we're in. Uh, but then today it's not kind of my strength area of a personality. And it's not the place where I spend my most, you know, uh, precious brain cycles thinking about uh, go to market tactics, but you have to do it, right? You can't get around it. It is, it is a key part of getting something off the ground. And so one thing I've come around to looking for is that balance of skills on that early team, um, uh, or at least a desire, a self-awareness on behalf of the technical founder to complement themselves, to bring on 
uh, go to market talent, people are, are going to do those early sales. Like I, I think the, um, the, there is much to be learned in the early days by technical people attempting the sales themselves. But I think there is a certain um, hard headedness about that, that I try to avoid because I've had some painful lessons sure. learned myself and, and seen in other companies yeah. where um, so, the success me, comes from a mix of skills for sure. Let me ask you a more specific question on uh, just uh, selling sort of enterprise tech products. The you know, true moment of value in these products comes after you've made a bunch of investment as a, as a buyer in buying the product, then implementing it, and then you know whether it really works or not. And yeah. so oftentimes in the early sales process, uh, the buyer is trying to make up their mind on whether they should spend that time and money. And yeah. so it seems like it comes down to some technical differentiation in that pre-sales process. And if you hit the nail on that he on the head on that differentiation, then it sort of works. Is that the best way to think about it uh, for sort of founders who are trying to convince their first two, three customers to, you know, co-develop, pilot it, whatever? Yeah, I think so. I think um, in the case of Fivetrain, for example, actually, I think this is a core strength, which is the incumbents, the old ways of doing uh, ETL are things that you have to buy into and then invest a lot of time into. I think the five train experience is, is totally different, right? Which is like, you know, give us some credentials, authorize, authorize one of these data sources and, you know, go away for 10 minutes and we'll come back and show you what you've got in your snowflake instance. And so it is a very fast, you know, uh, demonstration of that aha moment where, you know, yeah, it's not going to be all of your data immediately. They're, in the early days, not going to have all of your connectors, but you see the value of their approach and kind of what's different about it. And the, like you said, the technical differentiation. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's what I look for. And I think that's today what's, what's most successful out in the market is you don't have to solve the customer's problem entirely in that pre-sales process. Yeah. Um, your early product is, you know, probably haven't built enough to even try, but I think you have to find a way to demonstrate that inkling of value that makes people intrigued, that makes them appreciate what you bring that's different to the table, whether it's technical or it's through some workflow, UX innovation or whatnot, where they'll spend the time with you. I think just pitching them on the end value prop, um, and, and sort of try the old traditional sale of, you know, we're going to, we're going to give you this big behemoth and, and we're going to configure it for you. And you're going to buy it all at once. And six months later, it might be delivering value to you. Like maybe it works, but I, I don't spend any time Sorry. thinking about those sorts of companies. So uh, this has just been an amazing story. And, you know, when I look at where five plan is, where you have all of these data connectors to all of these big products on one side, and then these data warehouses on the other side, just seems like they're they've got like a, a unbelievable position on this data highway, and I I can't wait to see what they do next and what you do next with those insights and what kind of companies you invest behind. So I'm looking forward yeah. to that. Uh, I want to come to my last part of the podcast, and you know you've been sort of tinkering around with me and uh, helping me think through what we are doing in the India India SaaS corridor and especially the India US corridor and uh, some of the core tech founders that are coming out of India. Uh, and I think you're pretty plugged into the India diaspora in, in the U.S. as well. So do you see things changing with these India startups coming, especially with pretty technical ideas? Uh, what excites you? What worries you? It's a good question. I mean, definitely the, the quality of the founders I encounter is, you know, is, is excellent. I, I feel like there's, you know, uh, there's there's kind of, I think there's less of like a big disconnect, right? I think, I think the people that um, uh, may have found their way to the U S uh, now, you know, they're, they're connected to the U S they're maybe fundraising in the U S to some degree, or they're, or they're looking for early customers. But um, uh, I think to our detriment, I think they are less likely to, to, to come here. And I think they build for, for their market, for, for what 
uh, uh, makes sense for a, a broader world. And so, um, you know, I wish I had some grand insight. I think the, the interesting thing that, that kind of intersects with some of my overall investment areas is I think um, we're just getting to a place from an infrastructure perspective and a data perspective where the world for better or for worse is balkanizing a little bit. Like it matters, it matters, you know, where your data lives. It matters how you build your product relative to the regulation and, and consumer demands of various markets. Um, and so I think infrastructure companies, developer tools company, I think have more of an opportunity to take a lot of the UX insights, a lot of the like um, aesthetic and, and best practices that have developed in the US for, I don't know, five, 10 years now and apply them uh, all over the world in a way that leverages what's unique about those markets, what's unique about the applications that people are building uh, on top, what's unique about the demands of the enterprises in India, in China, wherever. Um, and you end up with different products, right? Yep. I think I think there's a lot of things we look at together that um, I'm like, oh, this is like the Indian version of XYZ. And when you dig into it, it's like, no, yes, it is that Indian version of XYZ at a very high level, but there's lots of nuance and insight that's uh, unique to the Indian market that, um, uh, you know, makes it a big, big opportunity. That's yeah. that's interesting for, for us to invest in. No, and it's funny that you say that. It, that's one. And the second is, I think what's different for me is today they're able to find their first customer that they're sort of co-developing the product with, which has the same level of complexity or maybe greater sometimes because of the concurrency of these platforms in India as the U.S. counterpart. And yeah. therefore the level of product that they're building seems to measure up versus being sort of like a low cost version of For sure. of what somebody is building in the US. And I think the second thing, at least what we are seeing is uh, at least one founder moving to the US pretty quickly. Uh, and like you said, because, you know, especially around the data stack, stack people are sort of balkanizing. I think that, that's the word to be used. Uh, it, it just makes sense for you to be sort of uh, multi-location or multi-geo probably from day one uh, yeah. definitely from like three months in yep so last question uh, more sort of broad thoughts on future of data stack it just seems like you're spending a lot of time on uh, the intersection of health and tech uh, are you still spending more time on the data stack what are sort of big areas of interest yeah for sure i, I think there's kind of two interesting things to say there one is, I think, more of an um, investment lesson learned, which is, uh, I, think, uh, I think what was great, you know, what I'm really proud of in, in regards to the, the five train investment is um, we were early to that ecosystem. Not the earliest by any means, you know, obviously uh, Sutter Hill did a, did a really nice job with Snowflake and uh, they've, they've, they've reaped the rewards there. But I think relatively speaking, in terms of appreciating, you know, what this new movement is, what the implications are, what are the pieces required to actually make it happen, we were pretty early to that. And I think that the five train investment is, is testament to it. I think, um, uh, you know, one of the lessons learned is all good investment areas become pretty consensus over a couple of years. And so certainly after Snowflake went public, uh, you know, this whole modern data stack term was coined. There's been a lot of investment in the space. You know, every little box in a diagram of architecture uh, is, you know, has like three or four, five, six, you know, very well-funded uh, competitors. And so I spent a lot of time looking at many of them. Um, I've made a couple more investments in the space, but I think a big lesson learned is at the end of the day, um, uh, this job is about being early to big trends. And I think um, the best trends, you know, become consensus and the, the investment opportunities become less attractive. And so I think we're gonna see like a big, uh, I think we're seeing a big overfunding of the space in a lot of ways. And I think we're gonna end up seeing a lot of consolidation and a lot of, um, uh, 
you know, a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of battles play out over the coming years in this space. Um, and so, yeah, one, one of the things I'm always focused on, which is why I'm dabbling in health or other things is like, you can't, I think I, I don't want to make a career out of, out of one space. That said, the second thing uh, we're saying about it is I'm really excited about what happens once uh, this kind of movement as it is today gets digested by a lot of enterprises and you go into any kind of serious company or any startup really, and it's like, they've got the stack, they've got Fivetran, they've got DBT, they've got uh, one of the cloud data warehouses. It's just, it becomes kind of this like assumption that it's there and they have a modern BI stack on top of it. The question is what's next? You know, like the data is there. They have all the data that they gathered from all over the enterprise. It's well-organized, it's scalable, it's cheap. Um, it's fast to access. Everyone's going to look at a bunch of new charts as a result, which is fine. Like we've made some investments there. I think there's good opportunities there, but I think the biggest question is what's next. I think the, the, the data stack as it is today, the data warehouse becomes potentially a big operational leverage point that starts to flow back to, you know, how does the consumer experience the product? What decisions are made real time, whether it's fintech underwriting risk or you know optimization that is the result of the fusion of this data in one place that was very hard to accomplish uh, in prior generations of data like that is that is where i'm spending my time is you know not what do we need to do to make this movement happen in a two year time frame but what's going to happen once it's there and people want to do more with the data on a five year time frame or a 10 year time frame and so um, that's what I'm spending my time on. Cool. Ilya, this has just been a fascinating conversation. Thank you for spending the time. Uh, it's clear, you know, given your background, what you've done over the last five years, you have a way of seeing uh, what's going to come next. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the kind of investments you're going to make uh, and looking forward to finding things to work on together. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks for the conversation. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in. For more Matrix Moments episodes, you can head to www.matrixpartners.in slash blog. You can also follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube for more updates.